Well, welcome to Surviving Side Effects, Lymphedema, Fatigue, and More with Lauren Robbins. Uh, Lauren Robbins earned her doctorate in occupational therapy and a master's degree in healthcare operations management management. She has been a certified lymphedema therapist for more than a decade and is in private practice where she also specializes in breast cancer and oncology rehabilitation and restorative yoga. Lauren has developed many occupational therapy programs focused on uh, oncology rehab and she is also a very strong partner to A Time to Heal. Thanks Lauren. Thanks, Kelly. Can everyone hear me? Okay. I have a soft voice, so I thought I would use this microphone and I can put it right next to my mouth. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Kelly, for that. It's always nice to hear that your speakers have some education and experience in what they're talking about so you know that they're not just a stranger off the street or something like that. <laughs> So our objectives for this talk today, um, hopefully learn about several side effects and help manage those side effects. Now, do I have any healthcare professionals in the room? Okay, excellent. So I've got a few of those and then primarily survivors and caregivers, excellent. Okay, um, I will say just a uh, heads up, I tried to pack in as much as I could. I only have an hour, and I probably could talk about each one of these individually for an hour each, at least. So forgive me if I rush through something, but I also would like to have questions. I'm very informal, so please feel free to ask questions as we move along, and um, hopefully we can get through all of the side effects this morning. Just a little bit about me. Um, I, this is my lovely rescue dog, Roxy, that we've had for um, a few months now since September. She is just the absolute sweetest. Um, I'm a huge sports fan. That's me celebrating the Chiefs Super Bowl a few years ago, right before the onset of COVID, uh, down there in Kansas City. And I was able to go to game five last year, the NBA Finals with the Phoenix Suns. Uh, they lost, but you know. Um, love the outdoors. Me and my daughter and fiance love to go to the beach when we can. Uh, hiking, boating, and Halloween is my favorite holiday, which is my daughter's favorite ho holiday as well. And a few years ago, she was a werewolf and I was the full moon. <laughs> so we like to have fun. <laughs> so let's just jump right in to these side effects. Um, the first one we'll talk about is a biggie, cancer-related fatigue. So cancer-related fatigue, it is the most common reported um, complaint or concern from a survivor to their healthcare team. Over 90% of persons with cancer report fatigue. That's what the research says. I may say it, it might be even higher than that. Um, ways that we can manage cancer-related fatigue. And I should say, this is not just your, I'm tired today, or I'm a little sleepy. This is the, I'm exhausted, I can't lift up my head, um, my brain is not functioning well, you know, all of those kinds of feelings, which I'm seeing some head nods out there as well. So it's not just, oh, I'm a little tired today, or I didn't get enough sleep last night, I'll grab a cup of coffee and be good to go. It's not quite like that. It's like your entire body is exhausted. And when you think about going through treatment um, requirements with chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation therapy, why we wouldn't be that uh, fatigued, because your body is trying to heal physically from the inside out from all of those treatments and procedures um, and then we've got stress on top of it anxiety fear etc etc finance financial stress relationship stress etc but ways that we can manage cancer related fatigue the research is very clear that activity and exercise does help 
fatigue. Now that may be the last thing you want to do when you feel um, completely exhausted is to get up and exercise. Um, what I would suggest is it's not like we have to go out and run a marathon. We don't have to do crazy CrossFit exercises or things like that. Um, what I'm talking about is gentle exercise. The recommendations are for 20 minutes six times a week or 30 minutes five times a week. And remember, we can break that up. 20 minutes a day, you can do four five-minute sessions, five four-minute sessions. So you, all of that counts towards that total. So that's what we're trying to achieve is that 20 minutes a day, six times a week, or 30 minutes a day, five times a week. Yeah? Some of the easy things that we can do, if you feel comfortable, you can park a little bit further away at the grocery store, get your steps in. Get up and move in your kitchen. Get up to go to the bathroom. Get up during commercials. Stand, sit back down. Stand, sit back down. Again, it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be going to a formal exercise program at the gym or something. If you like to do that, great. And if you're up for it, wonderful. But I know many of us are in different places with our energy level. We can break up activities into smaller tasks. We can try other um, little more gentle exercises, such as yoga, chair yoga, restorative yoga, tai chi, walking, dance. Turn on some music in the living room and dance for a couple minutes. Dance in your chair, wiggle around a little bit. That counts. All of that counts. The key to all of this is to slowly work up and build up that activity tolerance or your endurance. The energy budget is something that um, A Time to Heal has it in their book, and I love this analogy. I'm um, talking about we budget for our finances, thinking about our energy the same way. So we always want to pay ourselves first. So invest in yourself, prioritize your activities. What are those things that are most meaningful that you want to get done? And generally, most people have their the most energy um, in the morning time when they first get up, and then it kind of wanes throughout the rest of the day. Um, so getting those things done, making a list, delegating as well. Some of us are not very good at that, um, but we can certainly delegate some of those activities or cut them out altogether if they're not um, providing you meaning, you're not enjoying them. Do you really have to do them? Do you really need to put away those laundry? That's, my, that's one of the ones that I am worst at. I can throw them in the wash, but put them away <laughs> for whatever reason. <laughs> I see some head nods. For whatever reason, I'm terrible at it. Um, so maybe putting it off a day. Is, is the world going to end if you do that? No. So thinking about um, exercise and, and, and activity in a, in a different mindset, a different perspective. So again, if you love going to a gym, if you love having a personal trainer, that's your thing, go for it. Do it. Enjoy it. Have fun. If it's not, find something that you do enjoy. People always ask me, what is the best exercise? What can I do? The one that you will do. <laughs> We've all been there where January comes and we say, I'm going to sign up for that gym membership. I'm going to go every day. And maybe you start off pretty good. And then usually everybody kind of dips a little bit, right, in February time frame. Same kind of idea with any of this stuff. So if you love swimming, go swimming. If you love dancing, do take a dance class. I mean, there's lots of different forms of activity and exercise. Vacuuming. Cleaning, all of that counts. That's activity. I see some smiles. <laughs> so just think about exercise and activity a little bit differently. It's not necessarily, you know, pounding your weights and, and strength training and, and all of that. We'd love for individuals to get to that point again, working on um, getting more comfortable, increasing that activity tolerance and your endurance. But you certainly don't have to start off with training for a marathon or something like that. 
pain is our next topic. <clears throat> So with pain, the research says 70% of persons with cancer report pain. And again, I would say in my personal experience, it might be a little bit higher than that. It could be bone pain um, from treatment itself, from the tumor maybe pressing or compressing on um, nerves in a certain area. It could be from treatment, surgery, um, or we don't really know what it's stemming from how to manage that pain, gentle exercise. I'm going to sound like a broken record. And again, this is slow, gentle type exercises, um, shoulder rolls, stretches. It doesn't have to be anything crazy um, out there. Relaxation techniques imaging, meditation, deep belly breathing, that's when, uh, or diaphragmatic breathing, when you breathe in, your belly should go out, and when you breathe out, your belly should go back down. It's a little bit easier to do and demonstrate when you're laying down uh, versus me. I could show you my belly <laughs> sticking out. And what, what those things are doing is um, research shows that it lowers your anxiety level, it lowers your blood pressure, and it helps your body kind of adapt to that pain that you're experiencing. Because when, you're th when you think about it, the pain, you have this heightened response from your body because it knows something is wrong, something hurts, so it's firing off all these signals. So if you can engage in that deep breathing meditation, it's bringing, that, bringing your body responses back down so that you can help manage. Distraction, so if you have other activities that you can um, participate in to help distract you, get your mind off these pain feelings that you are experiencing. Um, have a plan. If you know that certain activities or a certain time of day when maybe you're in between pain medications, for example, or something like that, have a plan. How are you going to handle that? Um, what, what things work for you? If you've tried the deep belly breathing and that doesn't do it for you, you need uh, meditation or relaxation, try to plan that into your day so you can help manage that pain so it doesn't come on all of a sudden and you have to stop what you're doing. It might be helpful to start with a pain journal. Some of us um, don't even know what maybe our trigger triggers are. Just a couple weeks, write down um, when that pain occurs, give it a number, um, try to name it in your body. Where is that pain coming from? What activity uh, what were you just doing that may have contributed to that pain? If you are um, taking some pain medications from your healthcare team, did you take one? When was the last time you took one? You know, those kinds of thoughts to help see if there is a pattern to your pain. Discuss with your healthcare team, of course. Um, they may be able to consult with other specialties, such as occupational therapy. Being a lymphedema therapist, I am a manual therapist, and so sometimes that can help um, manage the pain as well, seeing a specialist, perhaps a massage therapist who specializes in oncology as well can help manage that pain for you and with you. Questions so far? Okay. I have a question about fatigue. Yes. Is it unusual for the fatigue to last years? The great question. The question is, is it unusual for that fatigue to last years, you know, chronic? It absolutely can be. It absolutely can be. Um, and that's when I was saying that this this fatigue is different than your typical type.
tiredness, or I didn't get enough sleep last night, or I'm a, just a little tired today, a little groggy. Yes, absolutely, and particularly if um, individuals are on ongoing treatment, perhaps they're on hormone-targeted therapies, or um, chronic chemo treatments, oral chemos, Radiation therapy has also been shown. Now research shows that the, it's a long-lasting side effect, and it could be a late effect side effect, so it happens later. And that makes sense. If you are in the midst of treatment and you're focusing on surviving and getting through it, um, the body doesn't have a chance to process mentally, physically, because it's constantly trying to heal from those consecutive treatments or with the ongoing hormone therapy or something like that? Absolutely, great question. So in those cases, um, again, a journal may be helpful to keep track of how you're feeling. And it's also great to when you start to name that, give it a number, say on a scale of zero to 10, 10 being which, whichever way you wanna go, you know, zero means no fatigue, I'm great, let's take on the world. 10 means, oh my gosh, I can't lift my head. Where are you that day? And then a couple months later, after you're doing gentle exercise, maybe you started Tai Chi, you know, whatever that activity might be that you want to engage in, go back and see where you were, and then compare to where you are now. Great question. Yeah, little by little. And sometimes it, it feels like you're not making that progress. And then we start in with the shoulds. I should be doing this. I should be feeling better. I should be feeling healed. And I will say stop shooting on yourself. Give yourself grace. Everybody is different. And you gotta do what's, what's, uh, what feels right for you, what feels good for you. Did you have a question? A little unclear on the difference between OT and PT regarding pain and recovery. I, I've gotten some mixed information. I was told to see a PT after my double mastectomy last mm -hmm. month, and but then I hear people do OT. Yep. So I, that's a little fuzzy to me. I don't, I don't understand who to go to. Good, great question. The question is talking about PT and OT and what's the difference and. Um, is there a difference and things like that? Um, I, I'm an OT, so I can speak from my perspective. Different healthcare uh, systems may have OTs specialize in it and may have PTs specialize in it. There is a lot of overlap when it comes to um, some of this work, particularly with lymphedema. We are trained exactly the same thing with the same way, excuse me, with lymphedema. What I would suggest is um, as long as the individual therapist has additional training, additional education, maybe specializes in something, um, that's what I would go for, regardless if they're an OT or a PT. How we are trained is a little bit different. OTs are a little bit more holistic in our training, our, our OT education, versus PT is a little bit more focused on um, exercise and range of motion and a little more like a joint range of motion, for example, where an OT might say, okay, what do you need to do with that arm? Let's go for that. So it's just slightly different perspective and education, but we're all aiming towards the same. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah, so as long as they've got some credentials, uh, education, the certified lymphedema therapist would be great, regardless if they're a PT or OT. Um, so where would you find, like you said, like a massage therapist that mm. special, like where do, you, where do you resource the, you know, the people like, like you said, even for like the lymph, um, lymphedema and stuff, but like where do you, where would I find who would be a specialist in those? Great question. So the question is, where do I find these people? <laughs> where do I find these specialists? OTs, PTs, lymphedema therapists, massage therapists. Start with your healthcare team, your nurse navigator, your oncologist. Start with them, because they usually um, have a pretty good idea of who's available out in the community. Um, social worker also is pretty connected, usually. Uh, depending on where you are in the country, 
sometimes the support groups like this, like a time to heal, might have connections as well. There are some national organizations too, like the National Lymphedema Network is one as well. But I, I would say start with your healthcare team and go from there. Like most of my patients are, are word of mouth. I don't do marketing. I'm bad at that. I need to get better at that. But that's that's where I I would start. Great questions. Yes. I have to say in the, in the rural areas, though a lot of these support groups and so forth are not available for the treatment people. Yes, in the rural area it is a little bit more challenging. You might have to drive um, quite a ways in some respects to find some of these specialists. You are absolutely correct. Um, in that case, maybe telehealth might be an option um, with the health system as well. You know, it's a little bit more challenging to do manual therapy <laughs> via telehealth. Uh, you'd much rather be in person, of course, to perform that with the patient, but at least they could maybe teach you some techniques to do on your own as well. Um, so that, at least with, um, if one good thing came out of COVID, it was was some of the connectedness that we have via Zoom and, and telehealth and things like that. You're absolutely correct. Our rural areas definitely are lacking in some of these specialized treatments. Good questions, lots of engagement. So lymphedema is our next side effect and like I said I mean I could spend days talking about lymphedema so I'll give uh, kind of a condensed version here lymphedema is a swelling that occurs from some kind of damage done to your lymphatic system so in the case of um, those with a cancer diagnosis or treatment typically it's from surgery and or radiation so lymph nodes have been removed even one um, lymph node means that the lymphatic system is not functioning as efficiently as it was before. It doesn't mean 100% that you're going to get lymphedema, but it does pose a risk because it's not functioning as efficiently as before. What I would say here is definitely you want to see a certified lymphedema therapist. CLT behind their name um, is what I would recommend. And then they can assess you and give you an individualized um, treatment program. Treatment program itself may um, involve compression sleeves or stockings, compression bandaging, perhaps self-care exercises, um, addressing infections and decreasing your risk for infections are kind of the hallmarks and then what that looks like varies from patient to patient. So the lymphatic system, just a few um, quick notes. It's, it's responsible for maintaining our fluid balance in our body. Um, so it's, it's kind of, I would describe it as kind of like the sewer system of, their bo of our body. It helps um, absorb all of the gunk, the extra stuff, the, the toxins, um, proteins, things like that, that our body wants to get rid of, and it does that for us. It actually recirculates about three liters of fluid every day for us. It's absolutely essential with life. So if for whatever reason um, someone was born without a lymphatic system, they would not be able to survive. So it is that essential to our existence, and yet how many people know about it? <laughs> and even, and I will get on my soapbox a little bit here, um, even your healthcare team, your oncologist, your nurse navigator may not be um, super informed about it. They may say, oh, no big deal. You had one lymph node removed. You don't need to worry about it. What I advise my patients is, ideally, I would love to see you before <laughs> surgery, before you start treatment to get um, those baseline measurements and get you some education prior to. That doesn't always happen, um, you know, like with healthcare. Um, and then my other thing that I get on the soapbox for is we treat every other acute injury. Why not our lymphatic system? If you sprained your ankle, you were going to treat it, right? 
you do your NSAID, you do your ICE, you elevate it, you might have a wrap, something like that. Why not our lymphatic system? It's been injured, so it needs treatment. So just some facts, um, lymphedema has an incidence worldwide, about 140 to 250 million people. The highest incidence is actually caused by a parasite, which sounds really gross, um, but it's when mosquito bites you and then they leave their larvae inside and they really like this groin area right here. And so um, those that are living near the equator um, that don't have repellent and um, don't, the mosquitoes don't die off in the winter and things like that have a higher risk for that. Breast cancer is about 20 plus million. And then primary lymphedema is congenital, so you were born with a lymphatic system that um, wasn't as efficient, so it's kind of tangled or, or something like that. Lymphedema occurs in about 50 to 70 percent of women who have had axillary lymph node um, surgery, severe in 10 percent. Other research, you will see a quite a range from 7 to 63 percent. Generally, we agree around 20 percent of persons with breast cancer will develop. The reason why I put those um, different data points in there is not to confuse you, but it's to say that there is not a clear um, diagnosis or definition of lymphedema among healthcare individuals. If you ask a lymphedema therapist, my definition would be very different than going to see a surgeon who says, oh no, my, my patients don't get lymphedema until their arm is really swollen, right? Um, so that's why there's, there is a discrepancy and um, those of us that are doing the work may have a different philosophy, let's say. Um, cancer and cancer treatment is the most common cause in the United States. There is no pill or diet for lymphedema and there's no cure. So once you have it, you must manage it for the rest of your life, which again is why it's so important to see a lymphedema therapist um, as soon as you can to receive that individualized plan. And then I like this visual um, because it really shows you where I would love to see my patients first. And then you can see the progression. Typically, when I start to see people is over here on where it says tape measure. But look at all of that time where I could have seen someone to help maybe mitigate that and not get to that point. So that's why I, I get a little... Um, on my soapbox on that one. And then things to look out for, generalized achiness in that affected limb, tingling, heaviness of the limb, or fatigue in that limb. Maybe jewelry's fitting tighter, sleeves are fitting tighter, things like that would be an indication to go see someone. And if your oncology team this, I might get in trouble. If your oncology team says, oh, no big deal, you don't need to deal with that, um, go to a primary care, go to a nurse practitioner, go to, we can take orders from anybody. So if you feel you've got to do what's best for you. So, and then I always say I've never had, in my entire career, I've never had one patient walk out of my room and say, well, pff, that wasn't worth it. They got information, they got education, they know what to look out for, they can advocate for themselves. On that note, <laughs> we'll move on. <laughs> so our next side effect is the chemo-induced peripheral neuropathy. This is another biggie, and um, thankfully, the rest of the healthcare world has kind of come um, closer to actually acknowledging that this does exist and the patients are experiencing this. So the research, the latest research that I could find talks about 30 to 40 percent of those receiving the neurotoxic chemotherapies uh, may, may experience CIPN, and that's your cisplatin, your taxanes, adriamycin, you know, those that end in the in, the sin, would be um, your more neurotoxic. 
It, it, it involves various symptoms um, from person to person. It could be tingling, pain, numbness, typically in the hands or the feet. And it can impair activities of daily living, such as typing, dressing. It can reduce your balance, so you might be at risk for um, falls as well. And sometimes it gets really bad where individuals reduce or discontinue their chemotherapy because it's gotten to that point because they're so neurotoxic. Um, there's a significant lack of research in this area as far as what helps and what um, treatments go for this. There are some that are starting to ice the um, fingers and feet while they're getting treatment. They have learned about that. Um, I will say therapists were doing that a long time ago. Uh, but we're the ones doing the work, so we don't have the time to do the research part of it. We just know that it works, but we don't have the, the research and the means to do that. So what I do with my patients is uh, lots of sensory activities, lots and lots, motor activities, Activities, coordination activities. Um, how I explain it is that the chemo, and this is in my pea brain, the chemo goes all throughout your body. And you think about those little chemo crystals, they get stuck. They tend to get stuck in the furthest away from your heart that's helping to pump fluid and process. So your fingers and your toes and your feet are furthest away from your heart. So th then they kind of sit there and they literally numb those nerves. So your nerves kind of forget what they're supposed to do. So what my job is is to try to remind them of what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to sense pain, temperature, movement. They're supposed to be strong. They're supposed to be coordinated, right? Um, you know, putting on your necklace, putting on your earrings, buttoning. Think about all of those kinds of activities with your fingers. Dropping things. A lot of patients first notice that when they start dropping things. So I do a lot of sensory activities. Some things that you can do at home, it might sound weird, but get a, a bucket or a tub, fill it with rice, just plain old dry rice. Put objects in there that you would be able to know what they are. Close your eyes and try to find them. Pick them out of there. You know there's 10 in there, so you have to try to find them. So you're trying to force your brain and your fingers and hands to communicate. So things like that, playing cards. Um, Doing any and all of those activities that you would. I know it's frustrating. I know you're spending an hour to put in that damn earring. It's frustrating, right? Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Just like the this the, the adage, you know, if you if you use it, lose it, you know, that kind of thing. It's it's that kind of idea here. And then with your feet and your toes, you can do that bucket with the um, rice in it, not necessarily to pick up objects, but for the sensation piece of it, because it's different. It's totally weird. Who sticks their foot in a bucket of rice? You can also um, grab a towel on the floor with your toes to kind of scrunch it and exercise those foot and ankle intrinsic muscles. Um, any kind of different sensations that you can give your fingers and your feet, like cotton, denim, corduroy, all of those can help stimulate those nerves and remind them of what they're supposed to do. Um, all during that time, you can close your eyes, engage your brain. Your brain, you know, you know this is um, linen, you know, my pants are linen. What does linen feel like? It is soft, you know, engage your brain. Tell it what it's supposed to be sensing and feeling. I know it sounds a little hokey, I know, but think about it as you're trying to reconnect your brain to these nerves. Um, what I, one thing I've been trying was uh, I've been dropping a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. So when I'm doing dishes, particularly my room makes very special dishes, I pick one up and I, I talk to myself. Mm -hmm. and don't, or, no, I don't use negative. So hold on tight, hold on tight. Mm -hmm. Just kidding. Am I kidding myself that that makes a difference? No, it absolutely does. Absolutely. Talk, yes. 
talk to yourself, engage your brain, remind yourself of what you're supposed to be doing. Yes, because these are activities you didn't have to think about before. You didn't have to pause and do that before. It was just almost automatic. Um, it's forgotten. It's literally numbed what it's supposed to do. Yes, absolutely. Talk to yourself. You heard it here. <laughs> Any other questions on this one? I know this one's kind of a, a biggie for people. Yes. Um, I have the neuropathy. And one of the things that I'm trying with my hands is I get one of those soft stress balls. And I stress them because I also get the cramping in my hands as well. And I find that that really helps. And whenever I'm sitting there, so I'll just pick it up and do it for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. down. And I do that many times during the day. Just pick it up again. Great idea. Using a stress ball, absolutely. Um, Theraputty or something with a little bit more resistance to build up some strength as well. Stretches, too. Just doing opening up your hand and slowly closing. Opening up your hand, slowly closing. Um, bring up a good point. Maybe during um, before, right before some of these activities where before you could jump right in and do the dishes. Now you might have to warm up a little bit, too. You could try that as well. <coughs> warm up your hands. Move them a little bit. Get the blood circulation going. Get those muscles going in the, before you engage in an activity. Prepare your brain. Helps with brain fog as well. The problems with sleep. So as many as 50% of patients report issues with sleep. Again, it might be higher than that. Um, now this could be insomnia or an abnormal sleep-wake cycle. And um, sometimes it takes a little while after you've gone through treatment and your days and nights are mixed up or um, you're having other you know, GI issues or things like that, the pain perhaps that it's keeping you up. So it could take a little while to get back to your t more typical sleep-wake cycle. So treating sleep disorders may include supportive care for side effects. It could be worth talking to your healthcare team about and perhaps some medication. Um, personally, after gone, going through all of um, treatment, radiation, surgery, you know, sometimes medications are the last thing that you want to do. So there are some other things you can try first. Um, co cognitive behavioral therapy may reduce anxiety and help you sleep. If you are not seeing a therapist or a mental health counselor, you can seek one out. And there are, at least I know of in the Omaha area, those that also specialize in, in oncology as well. Good sleep habits are super important. This is something that all of us can can benefit from. You know, I'm trying to get my fiance on board with this, and he keeps saying, "Well, you know, it's football season, it's basketball season, you know, and all these games go late." And I'm no, that doesn't work for me. I need to go to bed. <laughs> so good sleep habits include that same time uh, to sleep and same time to wake every day even on weekends, every day, because we're trying to train our brain and our body um, to get used to that sleep. Limit naps during the day to 20 to 30 minutes. Now, I didn't say don't take a nap. Limit to 20 to 30 minutes, because naps are good for us. Research does show um, that naps can be very beneficial to us, even though, even when you're younger and you're maybe career focused and all in, in that stage of life, taking a nap is, is a good thing to help recharge you, kind of give your brain a, a rest, give your body a rest. But when we start going beyond that 30 minutes, then it starts to kind of mess with your sleep cycle a little bit. Ditch the electronics at minimum 30 minutes before bed. So that's your phone, that's your TV, your iPad, your Kindle, <laughs> whatever else people have these days. That blue light coming from that device 
really messes with your brain. It tells your brain that it's still daytime instead of nighttime. So at least 30 minutes before bed. And then consider meditation. That's the time that I do my meditation before when I'm, I'm getting into bed and everything and comfortable. Um, and then I'll do my meditation for maybe five minutes-ish. And if I have a random thought about the grocery store tomorrow or something, I'll acknowledge it gently and then come on back to my meditation. It takes practice. There's also a lot of um, really cool apps out there now that, now I did say turn off electronic, right? But this one, um, you can turn it over, you can hear the sound still, so it's not that blue light shining on you. One is called Insight Timer, and, and I have it, oh, I didn't write it down, I'm sorry. Insight, I-N-S-I-G-H-T, timer. And so that one um, can walk you through different meditations and guided imagery and things like that. Anywhere from 10 minutes to 45 minutes. So those are kind of nice. Technology can be helpful. Okay, next one, menopause, osteoporosis, and hormonal concerns. Okay, so for those with hormone-related cancers like breast, gynecological cancers, or prostate, um, hormone blocking therapies and treatment can lead to a number of side effects. Cancer patients um, are at an increased risk for bone loss and fractures due to both the direct effects of the cancer on the skeleton and the side effects that come from many cancer-specific therapies. Surgery is a pretty good risk. Also, AIs or aromatase inhibitors. And then for um, our men is the androgen deprivation therapy, or ADT. So the ADT decreases testosterone. It, um, you might experience hot flashes, loss of muscle mass, joint pain, fatigue, and sexual wellness concerns. For women, it might be uh, vaginal dryness, thinner vaginal walls, skin dryness, fatigue, and joint pain. And the reason why we have the fatigue and the joint pain, you know, I've been really into learning about hormones lately. Estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, they all play this, this balance, this symphony inside us, whether we are um, born male or female. And when those are out of balance, something gets out of whack. And we really, I don't think, clearly understand how much those hormones are involved in our everyday functions. You know, for estrogen, for example, is a lubricator, so certainly, um, going through menopause, you may notice the vaginal dryness or thinner vaginal walls, skin dryness as well, and joint pain. Estrogen is huge in lubricating our joints as well, which I didn't know that but until I um, became a therapist. So how can we address some of these things? Um, gentle exercise, again. Um, we think about with the synovial fluid in our joints, when we move, that triggers um, our bodies to produce that lubrication. So this is definitely a use it or lose it situation. So if you are moving gently, again, you don't have to run marathons. Walking, yoga, tai chi is a wonderful exercise, but that is encouraging fluid to be produced and that can help bathe those joints. We all know when you've gone to sleep and in the morning you wake up a little bit stiff, well that's because you haven't been moving for a little while. Maybe that, you know, eight hours or so when you're sleeping. So it makes sense when you think about it like that. Um, acupuncture and acupressure have a little bit of research now um, on some of their benefits, particularly for ladies with hot flashes and um, 
hormone imbalances. And if you're into that sort of thing, it's all about the chi and your energy that has been um, kind of messed up. It's kind of clogged or it's blocked. And so those um, particular practices focus on making sure everything is flowing as it should and as it needs to. You can also look at Reiki or um, Healing Touch as well, but they, they don't have the um, research behind them at this point. Not saying they don't work, they just don't have the research. And then the aromatase inhibitors, they are very interesting because they, they inhibit aromatase from turning androgen into estrogen in areas of the body other than the ovaries and are used in postmenopausal women typically with hormone receptor positive cancer. Um, they help to reduce the risk of cancer recurrence because they decrease that estrogen, excuse me, but be decreasing that estrogen causes an increased risk for osteopenia and osteoporosis as well as fractures. <coughs> How we address um, osteoporosis, uh, osteoporosis, what is that? Osteoporosis and osteopenia, um, definitely talk with your healthcare team and they may want you to take a vitamin D supplement, perhaps um, get a DEXA scan done, you know, to figure out where you are with that perhaps. And the other thing that really helps um, is weight bearing. So with this one, this is really cool. I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to these things. So we have um, blastocyst, and those are baby bone cells. Again, my pea brain, how I explain it. But when you weight bear or you resistance train and you put some kind of force on the bones, the muscles are twerking the bone when you weight train. Or when I'm just standing here and weight bearing, it's triggering those baby bone cells to mature to actually form the osteoclast on the insider bones and reinforce them and make them stronger. So that's why weight bearing is super important. And then with your arms, it's the resistance training that helps create that torque from the muscles moving and torquing your bones to trigger them. So, I don't know, I'm a nerd, so I kind of thought that was cool. Um, some of those other chemotherapies that may cause some of this premature menopause, adriamycin, uh, methotrexate, the cytid, cytoxin, you know, again, some of those sins and they end in the XAN. One more thing to keep in mind with with some of these changes is uh, posture changes as well. Uh, us ladies tend to have a little more rounded shoulders regardless because our upper bodies aren't quite as um, big and strong as our male counterparts. So definitely us ladies have to be mindful of this and then you think about now in today's day and age, we're on the computer, we're on our phones, we're always in that kind of um, bent over position, so that's just further reinforcing that rounding of the shoulders. So what we want to do is opposite. I see everybody sitting up now when I do this, yeah? I know. I do it all the time. We just, just remind ourselves, yep, squeeze those, squeeze those shoulder blades together, and it feels good, right? Just to, oh yeah, just do one of those. Um, you know, lift your chin up. And then I'll do one of these two, where I'll tuck my tuck my chin as well, because this is with your cell phone and you're like this. And then as your eyes change, you're <laughs> leaning forward. <laughs> so all of those things, just keep in mind that these treatments put you at a, a greater risk for that because uh, chemotherapies, the uh, other ones are making your bones a little bit weaker, the muscles are a little bit weaker, loss of muscle mass, and remember, us ladies don't have that mass quite as much to begin with anyway. So a really good exercise is you're working on your scapula, your periscapular muscles. 
I know, when I do that, everybody literally sits up. <laughs> totally fine, totally fine, that's good. Okay, another biggie is the cancer-related brain fog. Now, I call it cancer-related brain fog, not chemo fog, um, because individuals who have not had chemotherapy also experience um, a lot of these similar things, and research does back that up. There's a really cool twin study on that one. So approximately 20 to 50% of patients experience cognitive loss. This could include short-term memory issues, difficulty concentrating, loss of focus, fatigue, forgetting words. And for most patients, the good news is it is transient and temporary. And then, <laughs> you totally can still go for it. I still do mom brain, I mean, come on. So the, some of these things, and, and when you're when you're experiencing it, patients tell me that it's just the you know it feels one thousand times worse than probably it is, but you're not you. You don't feel like you. You can't. You're not just sharp. Uh, maybe at work you uh, were known for this person, and then all of a sudden you're like, holy crap! I mean, uh, I don't remember how to do that. You know, it's just not quite as quick. Um, so how to manage these things, and A Time to Heal, I will put a plug in, has the chemo, um, or the, excuse me, brain frog uh, course as well. So highly recommend that one to really get in depth into some of these areas. I'm just kind of on the surface here. How to manage. Okay, this one's super hard. Write things down. <laughs> Make a list. And I tell you, this is something that all of us need to do, not just those that may be experiencing brain fog. But what this does is actually it helps um, utilize your executive function in your frontal lobe. Instead of having rote memory from back here, kind of your lizard brain, back here, instead of saying, remember the such and such, remember the, you know, doing that, we've all done that. Write it down because you can say, I know I'm going to forget this. I'm going to write this down. I'm going to take a note. That's actually using your executive functioning and helping your brain more. It is not a crutch. It is not a negative. It doesn't mean that you are losing it or you're not as sharp. It's actually helpful for our brains. Give yourself time and patience. Huge, 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 huge. In this day and age, we are running our butts off every day. We have eight million alerts on our phones. If you're in, if you're at work, you're pinging with messages and emails. I mean, it's just constant. So your brain gets very muddled and confused. Give yourself time to transition to whatever activity that you will be doing. I give myself a cue, and maybe you do too. I say, okay and then I go do it. I, it's just subconscious, I just do it. Um, so you might take note of maybe something that you tend to do, but that's the cue for my brain. I am done with this. I am moving on to the next thing. Multitasking, try not to do it as much as possible. I know that it's very difficult in this day and age. Give yourself some grace, give yourself some patience. If you can, laugh it off. Make an excuse, chemo brain or brain fog or you know whatever it is. Um, quiz your brain. I love this one. So if you're having word finding issues, quiz your brain. You know it's uh, it's black and I, I use it when I when I talk on the, the phone, my cell phone. Qu qu quiz yourself. Let your brain get there. Have your friends and your family help you instead of they just saying your cell phone, mom. Have them help you. What does it look like? What, is, what do you use it for? What does it taste like? You know, what activity are you doing? That helps your brain learn. Maybe it's anxiety, maybe it's depression, maybe it's fear that's going on, maybe it's that stress going on. So seek professional help. You know, an occupational therapist or a speech language patho pathologist um, has certain tools like we've discussed so far and can work on some of these things. Um, but we're not licensed mental health practitioners. So if you, if you need um, that kind of help, 
see a specialist, absolutely. Exercise. It's, I swear, exercise is the cure-all. It is. Uh, but think about it, blood pumping and moving. It's moving and pumping and exercising your brain, too. You also have to keep track. Maybe you're counting reps. You know, all of that, too. But gentle exercise has um, shown research has shown to help with brain fog. Relaxation techniques as well can help with that. And again, this is just touching the surface because I know we only have a little bit of time this morning. So uh, if you're interested, Time to Heal has their brain fog course, which is wonderful. Sexual wellness. So this one is like the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about, but I love talking about it because it is so important and vital to relationships uh, with yourself as well as a partner, even if you're single um, and you don't have a partner, it's still a very important relationship with yourself. So it could be from treatment itself, like radiation, surgery, um, maybe a loss of a particular body part, or now there's scars and things. Maybe you're self-conscious with body image. Um, low libido, some of the treatments cause that. I think about if you're taking away all those hormones, if they're blocking your hormones, you're gonna have low libido because those hormones feed into um, your sexual drive. Maybe there's physiological changes now with surgery, uh, vaginal dryness, uh, testicle removal, etc. Sex or sexual touching may be painful now. Uh, maybe you just don't have, uh, maybe you have an interest in it, but it doesn't feel good anymore. Um, it hurts. Um, so along with this, Tips to manage, number one is talk. Communicate, communicate, communicate. I know it feels uncomfortable. I know you may not want to bring it up, but your partner maybe doesn't want to bring it up, but maybe they have thoughts. Um, maybe you're, you're a single person who um, needs to seek out some professional assistance from a, from a licensed mental health practitioner as well. But talk, communicate, share, break that ice. Um, you know, in, in relationships, sometimes talking about what you like and what you don't like and what you hurt, what hurts you, excuse me, what feels good may be taboo, um, but uh, it's, it's only going to help ease the anxiety, ease the stress, and connect again with your partner. Connect with yourself again. I'm not saying it's sunshine and rainbows and it's going to happen overnight, but it's a good first step. Start slow. Start very slow. Um, we don't need to jump right in and perform as we did before. Um, maybe talking is the first step. Maybe laying next to each other is the first step. Maybe holding hands is the first step. Warm up. We talked a little bit about earlier where we may not have needed to warm up with some of these activities. Um, engaging in sexual activity is the exact same. Maybe you need to warm up. Maybe you need to stretch. Maybe you need to warm up mentally. Maybe you need to read a book, um, one of those romance novels, or, or watch a romantic comedy or, or something like that that may get you in the mood. Warm up. And then, of course, seek professional help if this is an area that um, you would like to explore further because it is it's absolutely vital to relationship and this is not just sex this is intimacy feeling connected to yourself to your partner um, it's not just about the physical act either feeling connected i like to say so I know, gosh, guys, we covered a lot. I feel like I just did word vomit on all of these side effects. So hopefully you were able to get some good tips and information. And like I said, please know if you see uh, a PT or an OT or even a speech language pathologist for some of these things, they'll go much more in depth. I could have talked up here for an hour at least on any one of these. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'm happy to 
answer those or point you in the right direction. Does anyone have any questions right now? Some very good questions earlier. Yes. I hear people talk about um, hormone replacement, mm -hmm. um, you know, the pellets, the natural. As a cancer patient, are they ever going to, I think I asked my doctor years ago, and she was feeling like I was crazy. Ah. Uh, Yes, well, so there are probably a couple of different camps on that one. Um, as far as I know, they, those pellets are, continue to be synthetic, and th that could be a whole other conversation in itself. And so the best that I could say is if, if someone's cancer is hormone related, hormone positive, so estrogen positive, um, progesterone positive, or HER2 with a protein positive, and then with our guys with our prostate with andro androgen as well, it's not advisable. It's not advisable. Um, you could talk to your healthcare team about some natural perhaps routes, some, there, I know there's some herbs and some teas and, and things like that that they might be in favor of. What is difficult is the research is not there yet. Um, their Eastern medicine, you know, with, with Chinese medicine, they've been using some of those things for a very long time. Native Americans have been using those things for a very long time. We just don't have the evidence-based research right now, so I'm, I bet that they would probably he be hesitant on that. So unless they figure out a way for your body to produce that hormone, let's say estrogen, without it feeding the, the cancer itself, they're probably gonna say no. Like a cream or, yeah, there there are those options. It, it really talk to your healthcare team about that. They, those are still absorbed into your body and your bloodstream, so they end up being systemic. So um, yeah, I know. I hate to be the fun one talking up here about side effects with uh, menopause and and things like that. Um, I've also, research has shown exercise can help with some of the, like, the hot flashes as well. And then you've got your other kind of symptom management with the fan, with the cooling clothes, layers, you know, all of that kind of stuff too, to help kind of manage in the moment. Um, some people have noticed that it could be a little bit more related to anxiety as well. <clears throat> and then you get, or stress, and then you start sweating and then it makes it worse. So maybe managing some of that too can help. But yeah, as far as straight hormones go, I'm fairly certain that most healthcare individuals would probably say no at this point, unless they come up with something really cool. Great, any other questions? I've kept you longer, I know we want lunch. <laughs> okay, very good, thank you everyone.